Hello everyone, this is Serious Trivia, and today we're continuing our Sun Tzu lore series with episode 7, titled Revenge Against Liu Biao. So last episode, we left off at Sun Tzu, plotted against the alliance of Huang Zhu and Liu Xun. But in all honesty, Sun Tzu had no idea if his flattering letters and tribute would yield any results. So in the meantime, Sun Tzu readied his force at what would eventually become Jianye, as they prepared to either cross north to attack Liu Xun if he takes the bait, or sell west to attack Huang Zhu instead if Liu Xun does not take the bait, and choose to stay inside Wancheng in Ruzhang. And just as Sun Tzu was starting to give up hope on the plot and prepare to sell west instead to seek revenge for his father, spies returned with the news that Liu Xun had been spotted marching his force out of Wancheng, and now heads north for the grain storage at Shangliao. With not a moment to waste, Sun Ce immediately ordered his troops to cross north as he sent his cousin Sun Ben and Sun Fu to move their armed forces in between Wancheng and Shangliao so they can cut off Liu Xun's army from retreating back in case news of their sneak attack leaks out. Then Sun Ce swung his full force, numbering around 20,000, directly at Wancheng, where he and Zhou Yu wasted no time in not only capturing the city, but also finding love. And here is when Sun Ce and Zhou Yu would take in Da Qiao and Xiao Qiao as concubines, as they were well-known beauties in Wancheng. Then, with Wancheng firmly secured, Sun Ce ordered the 30,000 civilians and surrender troops to march back with him to the south, while leaving behind a small group of 3,000 men under the command of Li Shu, who Sun Ce had named as the new administrator of Lujiang. Meanwhile, Liu Xun, after learning that Wancheng was lost, tried to pull his army back to recapture the city, but on his march back to the city, he ran into the ambush laid by Sun Ben and Sun Fu, which forced him to flee south instead towards the Yangtze River. Without many options left for him, Liu Xun sent messengers to Huang Zhu, asking for aid. And soon, Huang Zhu's son, Huang Shu would sail down the Yangtze River with 5,000 marines to assist Liu Xun as the two forces tried to cut off Sun Ce on his return march to the south. But their efforts were wasted as Sun Ce's army annihilated them out in the open field as Liu Xun fled north to join up with Cao Cao, while Huang Shu abandoned his navy to flee on horse back to his father in Jiangxia. At the end of the day, Sun Ce got quite a nice haul as his campaign not only yielded the capture of Wancheng and the security of Lujiang, but he also captured 30,000 civilians, took in Da Qiao as a concubine, absorbed over 2,000 surrendered marines, and over a thousand ships from Huang Shu. Outfitted with this new influx of naval strength, Sun Ce started laying out plans for a naval invasion of Jiangxia later in the year as his troops rested for the time being in the south. It was the logical next step for Sun Ce, as the attack on Huang Zhu in Jiangxia would not only help him better secure control over the Yangtze River, it would also give him the chance to weaken Liu Biao and extract revenge for his father, who had died at the hands of Huang Zhu's ambush. But taking Jiangxia would be no simple task, as it was a key port on the Yangtze River, and any direct assault on the city would trigger reinforcements from Liu Biao, as well as a fierce and determined defense from Huang Zhu. And this time, Sun Ce couldn't rely on trickery as he did with Liu Xun, as neither Liu Biao nor Huang Zhu would believe a single word that he says, and to make matters worse, both of them are definitely already expecting an attack from Sun Ce. So the only options left here for Sun Ce was to pick the worst possible time for him to attack and use it as his opportunity, as that's when the enemy might lower their guards to give him an opening. So on December 8th in the year 199, during the dead of winter, when road conditions and waterways were at its worst with the wind blowing east back against Sun Ce's approach, Sun Ce's naval forces landed at Jiangxia. This tactical gamble paid off a little bit as Huang Zhu was caught off guard, but the salt still grinded down to a stop outside the city of Jiangxia, as Huang Zhu has placed well-garrisoned defensive encampments 
surrounding the city, and these encampments now prevented Sun Ce from actually attacking the city. Huang Zhu, on the other hand, was not in a rush to engage Sun Ce on the open field, as he bunkered down and held strong within these encampments. Huang Zhu was patient because he knew reinforcements were coming, since he had already sent riders to Xiangyang to inform Liu Biao of this attack. So for the next three days, Sun Ce's forces assaulted these encampments repeatedly, but like waves crashing at a cliff, these encampments held. And on the third day, or December 11th, Liu Biao's nephew, Liu Hu, and 5,000 elite spearmen had arrived to help Huang Zhu to break this siege. But unfortunately, the arrival of the reinforcements actually doomed Huang Zhu. As the two forces finally met in the open field, Sun Ce ordered an all-out charge with generals like Zhou Yu, Lu Fan, Chen Pu, Han Dang, Sun Quan, Huang Gai, all leading multiple prawn attacks on Huang Zhu's forces, which decimated them, leading troops to rout and fleeing in all directions, abandoning their defensive encampments. And some even tried to swim in the dead of winter. Seeing that the battle was lost, Huang Zhu escaped alone, denying Sun Ce the opportunity to avenge his father on the battlefield. But the aftermath of the battle was a disturbing sight. Over 20,000 of Liu Bao and Huang Zhu's combined forces lay dead in the field, including Liu Bao's nephew, Liu Hu. Another 10,000 men froze or drowned as they tried to escape the fighting on the land, and Sun Ce had not only won, but dominated Huang Zhu's forces at Jiangxia and the spoils of war were plenty. First off, Huang Zhu's family was captured, which included Huang Zhu's wife, concubines, and children. 6,000 more ships were added to Sun Ce's fleet, and piles of treasures and wealth were also hauled back to the south as Sun Ce sacked the city of Jiangxia. And this win not only put the fear in Liu Biao, but it also earned the respect of Cao Cao, who lamented that he should have curbed Sun Ce's growth a little sooner, and now with the unavoidable war in the north against Yuan Shao looming large, Cao Cao no longer had the manpower or energy to focus on the south. So instead of war, Cao Cao chose appeasement. Political marriages were arranged as Cao Ren's daughter married Sun Ce's younger brother Sun Kuang, and Cao Cao's own son Cao Zhang took Sun Ben's daughter as wife. Cao Cao also ordered the administrator of the Yang province to write a recommendation for Sun Quan and Sun Yi that allowed them to start receiving official government appointments. Well, Sun Ce definitely enjoyed these appeasement measures, he was also well aware that they are just appeasement measures meant to slow him down, and if anything, it showed Cao Cao's weakness rather than strength. So in the early month of the year 200, Sun Ce started laying the groundworks for assault on the capital of Xuchang, while Cao Cao's forces were busy fighting Yuan Shao at Guandu. Although we have no way of knowing if Sun Ce's aim was to free and empower the emperor Liu Xie, or to simply replace Cao Cao as the next regent, we do know for certain that this would have been Sun Ce's next step, had not been for a hunting trip on May 5th of the same year. In one of our previous episodes, we talked about a man named Xu Gong, who had been one of these gentries from the Xu province that had fled south in the early days of the Yellow Turban Rebellion and Dong Zhuo's rise to tyranny. And thanks to his gentry status, he was able to eventually land on his feet in the Wu commandery as an official working for the local administrator. And when that administrator fell ill, he was named as the interim administrator in his place, and fast forward through a devious murder attempt and a defeat at the hand of Zhu Zhi, Xu Gong eventually hid out in Xu Zhang under the protection of Xu Zhao, who Sun Ce had respected. But as we mentioned before, he still despised Sun Ce for uprooting him from the Wu commandery, so he had plotted against Sun Ce by writing letters to Cao Cao suggesting the best way to curb Sun Ce's growth was to give him a high government position in the capital and summon him to Xu Chang where he would have become nothing more than a prisoner in Cao Cao's court. And if Sun Ce had refused this appointment, then the court could deem him as a traitor and call forth a coalition to end him. It was indeed a shrewd plan. And if we just look at what eventually happened to Ma Teng and his sons, who took the jobs in the government, we can be sure that the outcome for Sun Ce would have been certain death either way. 
So when Sun Ce found out about these letters, he summoned Xu Gong to confront him. And even though Xu Gong tried to deny these charges, Sun Ce had all the letters in his possession. So he showed them to Xu Gong as proof before personally strangling him to death. But Xu Gong's death was not the conclusion of this story, as Xu Gong's son and a group of house guests loyal to him escaped into the mountains, where they planned their revenge. So on May 5th in the year 200, three of these house guests of Xu Gong dressed up as Sun Ce's troops and snuck into the forest where Sun Ce was hunting and they waited for their opportunity. And their opportunity would rise when Sun Ce's fast horse separated him from his guards, yet their ambush was not entirely successful, as Sun Ce had managed to spot them first before they could fire their arrows. But instead of running away, Sun Ce, who at this point was definitely a bit overconfident about his conquest of the south and defeat of Liu Biao, approached them instead as he asked them to identify themselves. The three assassins tried to play it cool by claiming that their troops had belonged to Han Dang's unit, but Sun Ce quickly replied saying that he knows everyone from Han Dang's unit, as he raised his hunting bow and put an arrow right through one of the assassins' heads. A quick exchange of arrow ensued, where one arrow from the assassins finally found its mark on Sun Ce's face as the arrow pierced through his cheek into his mouth. Very soon, Guards that were lagging behind arrived on scene as they made quick work of the assassins and rescued their lord, who at this point had passed out from blood loss on his face. Sun Ce was rushed back to the doctors, who managed to patch up his face and stop the bleeding, and Sun Ce was at least well enough to speak and communicate. So Sun Ce summoned his court to his bed and informed key positions like Zhang Zhao that he wishes to pass on the command in case of his death to his younger brother Sun Quan instead of his son, since he knew that his death would bring unrest throughout the south, and that his son was still simply too young to take over. So he then grabbed Sun Quan's hand as he handed over his seal to him, and told him that, although you don't have my talents for commanding the army on the battlefield, you have shown more promise than me when it comes to managing and using talent. Right now, the Central Plains is still undecided, as the various factions battle for control. I might not leave you with much, but with the natural barrier of the Yangtze River and the strength of our army, we can definitely afford to sit out and watch the tigers of the Central Plains fight each other to exhaustion. And even though the doctors tried to reassure Sun Ce and the court that with proper rest and medication, Sun Ce can recover from this wound, Sun Ce would dismiss them as he looked in the mirror to see his scarred and bloody face and angry lamented that how can he go on to lead the people with a face like this. And later that night, Sun Ce would pass away at the age of 26 after a seven year blazing conquest that would earn him the nickname of the Little Conqueror as he cemented the foundations for the future of Kingdom of Wu. Now, I know there is other versions of his death from the Romance of the Three Kingdoms and other tales where we have the Taoist sorcerer Yu Ji playing a significant role, but all historical records indicate that Sun Ce died on the same day as his assassination, so like a lot of other stories from the novel, it's definitely fictional. So whereas this would normally wrap up our lore series since we have finished covering Sun Ce's life from start to finish, there have always been requests for alt history discussions and what if scenarios for many of our lore series. So given this unique opportunity here where Sun Ce had died too young, I've decided to add one more special episode to this lore series dedicated entirely to the concept of what could have been. So please come back next time and join us as we will conclude our Sun Ce lore series officially with episode 8 titled What Could Have Been. Once again, thank you all for watching. I hope you all enjoyed this episode and see you all next time. Bye!